Alors, on est avec Jack Adelstein, qui est l'auteur de Tokyo Vice, donc la non-fiction des éditions Marchiali, qui vient de sortir en librairie, et qui est euh, une non-fiction euh, vraiment qui m'a passionnée, que j'ai lu. Il fait 500 pages, je l'ai lu en deux jours. Euh, voilà, j'avais dix jours pour faire l'interview et en fait, j'ai juste pas dormi pour le lire. Ça raconte donc euh, la vraie histoire de Monsieur euh, Jack Adelstein qui est ici, qui à 24 ans euh, débarque au Japon et devient journaliste pour le Yomiuri Shimbun. C'est le premier occidental à l'époque à, à le devenir. Il, est, euh, il fait ses preuves à, dans la préfecture d'Urawa. Il va rencontrer Sekiguchi, un inspecteur qui deviendra son mentor. De faits divers en faits divers, il monte un peu au sein du journal et il se retrouve à Tokyo à la brigade des mœurs pour couvrir donc les, les faits divers du quartier, de, du quartier chaud de Kabukicho et de Ropongi. Il va pénétrer dans ce monde de la nuit avec bar à et, et, et moult de prostitution jusqu'à mettre sa vie en danger. Et c'est de ça dont on va parler. Euh, Jack Adelstein, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup d'être venu. Bonjour, merci. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer euh, pourquoi avoir choisi la difficulté C'est-à-dire pourquoi avoir choisi d'être journaliste alors que vous êtes américain au Japon Basically, I was in Japan studying Japanese and I had a year of college left and I already had a job lined up and I wanted to force myself to study Japanese much more. So, Japanese newspapers um, are national newspapers, that's the norm, with local supplements and they hire by examination. So I thought, I will study for the examinations and I will see how good my Japanese level is and it, it'll be something to, a goal to set for myself. But I never actually thought they would hire me and no one thought they would hire me because the tests are notoriously difficult um, and I was lucky. When I took the examination for the Yomiri Shimbun, um, the Japanese section I did well on, the translation section um, was extremely easy because I'd been doing translation for a long time to make a living as a student. And the essay was on Gaikokujin, which is Japanese for foreigners. And I had written an essay on Japan's immigration policy, and I remembered exactly how it had been corrected in my mind. So with the time that I was allotted to write the essay, I just reproduced what I'd already written before um, in fairly good Japanese. And I think that was instrumental in getting hired. Then when they offered me the job after a series of interviews, I was like, well, hell yes, you know, this is 10 times more interesting than working for Sony. Vous parlez beaucoup de la chance au début du roman que vous avez eu. Vous avez rencontré notamment beaucoup de mentors euh, qui vous ont donné de très bons conseils. Est-ce que vous pourriez, il y a plein de mademoiselles qui sont intéressées par le milieu du journalisme, parler un peu de votre expérience comme journaliste et transmettre un peu de, de ce qu'on vous, qu vous a appris First of all, I mean, journalism as it is now um, is a very unsteady job. So you really have to feel like it's a vocation, like it's a calling. If you don't have a passion for social justice or a desire to make the world a better place, um, it's hard to stick with. At the same time, you have to accept the fact that part of journalism is writing and doing the work that you have to do. About 95% of the job you do as a journalist is crap. It doesn't do anything for the world. It doesn't make the world a better place. It's just something you have to do. If you have to write another article about Burger King coming out with a cologne that smells like roasted sirloin because that's what readers want you do that and you hope to do investigative journalism and you hope to write about things that people don't want you to know um, i'm sort of paraphrasing something that is often attributed to george orwell but um, probably was said by someone at the washington post uh, the managing editor is journalism is writing about the things that people don't want you to know and in that sense it's a it's a it's a great job But the, the mechanics of things you learn as a journalism, um, and I don't know if they teach you in journalism school, is you have to get people to talk to you. Um, you can do a lot of information by getting on the internet and going through databases and looking at real estate deeds. It requires study and time. But often if you can get people to talk to you, that's the fastest way to get things done. Or you can get people to give you information or give you documents. So how do you do that? You have to know how to appeal to someone's self-interest. And whether that interest is um, uh, they don't like the current administration or there's a Yakuza boss that is their enemy who they would like to see go to jail so that they can take over their turf or they feel very strongly about whaling and they're working for a fishery company and they love whales. But you, you have to figure out what is it that I, can, that I can offer you to make you speak to me and then in what circumstances are we going to do this deal? Are you going to be my source in which case I have to protect you? Um, 
are you going to go on the record, which is always ideal. And if you go on the record, you understand what the, what the repercussions of going on the record are. And so there's many kinds of journalism. There's sports journalism, uh, there's celebrity journalism, there's investigative journalism. And what I like the most is investigative journalism because I think it serves the best function. Um, it's what's necessary for a democracy. Um, Japan has had some very good investigative journalism. Over the last few years, you, you see that the Japanese government has been cracking down on the media quite extensively to the point where um, Reporters Without Borders, which is headquartered in France, um, in 2011, they gave Japan a ranking of 11 in terms of world press freedom. Now they are number 61. I think this year they will be about the level of Uzbekistan. So you kind of, as a journalist in Japan, now you feel like you're in a, a critical time um, where you're protecting the rights of people to say um, what they want to say and the public right to know the things that the government and corporations don't want them to know. On va rentrer dans ce qui est euh, tristement le plus passionnant dans votre livre, le contact avec euh, ni plus ni moins que euh, les Yakuza. Vous avez réussi à vous mettre à dos euh, Tada, Tadamasa Goto, euh, le, le parrain de Goto Gunin, une des branches les plus, euh, à l'époque, dangereuses des, euh, des Yakuza. Comment est-ce que vous avez fait pour énerver euh, quelqu'un qu'on a aussi peu envie d'énerver Without giving away too much of the book, um, The Yakuza have always existed in Japan and been tolerated, tolerated because they have some code of honor. But Goto Tadamasa has no code of honor. He is a sociopath who is happy to kill civilians, um, who's broken all the codes that the Yakuza normally kept. Um, he's a monster. And one of the things that he did, because he's a monster and a coward, um, he made a deal with the authorities that he shouldn't have made to prolong his own life, and he betrayed his brothers in the Yakuza. Um, And even though I don't like the Yakuza, ratting out your brothers to save your own ass is a pretty cowardly thing. And when I found out that he'd done it, I started researching it once and I didn't get very far. Um, as a matter of fact, I called an institution in the United States and very quickly information got back to him. Um, but I never dropped the story. And in 2007, a police officer at the Kitazawa police station was uploading Well, he was downloading porn onto his computer and he accidentally uploaded all the files from the organized crime control unit. And in those files were records of Godo Tadamasa's travels to the United States, um, his front companies, his mistresses, his friends, um, his allies. And with that huge chunk of information, I was able to figure out when he had gone to the United States and really sort of narrow the investigation down to where I could get the answers. Because of course, as a journalist, sometimes you have to bluff. And sometimes you are slightly deceptive because you don't know all the facts, but you have to pretend you do to get people to talk. And after a lot of time spent going over reams of paper and talking to people and knocking on doors and bothering cops, I had enough to write, this, write a story that he felt would ruin his life and get him kicked out of the Yakuza. And he was correct because after I wrote it, he did get kicked out of the Yakuza, um, which I think was for the general good of all of Japan and even Yakuza society itself. Vous avez reçu la protection du FBI. À quel moment vous avez compris que vous iriez jusqu'à mettre votre vie en danger pour votre article? Um, it was like the November of 2007. Um, I knew all the story. I was writing Tokyo Vice. It was originally going to be published by a Japanese publisher, which, as we can all see, didn't publish the book for a number of reasons, but mostly because they were afraid their offices would be firebombed and their employees would be kidnapped. They weren't very careful with the contents of the book, and they basically put a synopsis of it on a European website. That got back to Tadamasa Goto, and then I was contacted by the police. I already had a sense that things were going a little wrong, that they were going to put me under protection and that lasted a couple years. Right now I'm not under any police protection. Um, I check in regularly with the local police to let them know that I'm fine, but I don't have people coming by my house every day, and, and I think that's okay. C'était quoi la motivation pour prendre autant de risques? Well, one is, is, I hate to see the bullies of the world win. I mean, if we run away from all the assholes of the world, the assholes are going to be running the world, so somebody has to stand up to them. And there is also a certain point when you're dealing with someone who is remorseless and is a sociopath 
that running away just makes the problem worse because they're just going to wait until things settle down and then they're going to kill you or they're going to make you disappear. So the most, the smartest thing you can do is find someone who is their enemy and become friends with their enemy and together you create a kind of alliance to destroy that person and then you live and your friends live. I mean that's a tough call because you're basically saying yes my life and my friends are worth more than your life and I would like to see you dead if I could possibly arrange it but you're a scumbag and I'm not so let's see what we can work out and that's kind of how I dealt with him. Mademoiselle est ainsi très attentif aux, aux conditions d'égalité homme-femme. Votre livre peut se lire un peu comme un, comme un polar, mais nous dit aussi beaucoup de choses de la, de la société japonaise. Il y a un personnage qui m'a beaucoup marqué et dont j'aimerais que vous parliez un peu plus. C'est euh, une collègue de travail qui a bossé avec vous, euh, bossé avec nous, vous, euh, lorsque vous étiez au bureau des mœurs à Tokyo, et c'est Amaya. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler un peu d'Amaya Uh, Japanese society is, is very sexist. I mean, I think there's a, the UN does a gender gap ranking every year or gender inequality, and Japan is like 107 out of 142 countries. It, it's particularly hard in some fields, um, such as journalism and police work, where you have very few females and you have to be very tough. Um, I had a colleague who I liked a lot. She was one of the few, few women in the um, national news department. As a matter of fact, there were so few women that one time we had this, we had this sort of asshole-ish caller call and he, he, wanted to, he wanted to complain about the baseball team and I answered the phone. And, you know, after talking to me for a few minutes, he was like, like, you, you know, like, can you put, you know, uh, you know like, you're, you're a foreigner and I don't want to talk to a foreigner. Can you put a Japanese person on the phone? So I handed over to Hamaya. She talked to him for a second and he was like, I want to speak to a man. She said, I'm sorry, there's only foreigners and women working here, so fuck off. Jing up on him. And I thought, I like this woman. I mean, but that's, I thought like, you know, it says a lot about the society that, that, that the one woman and the one foreigner in this office feel like a total minority. So there was a kind of solidarity there. Um, but she was really stubborn. And the Yomiri sometimes makes editorial policy. And if you don't fall in line with a the policy, then you get ostracized. Well, you, you can read the book. I mean, mm. it, it's... Uh, I mean, I like Kamiya-san a lot, um, and I was really sorry the way things turned out. Um, en tout cas, je vous invite à lire le, le livre, ne serait-ce que pour faire la rencontre de cette femme qui est euh, un personnage, enfin une personne extraordinaire. Il y a, euh, au début, j'allais presque en lisant le livre faire, j'avais envie de faire un critique. Voilà, je me disais, on est sur un, un polar, un roman noir, et, euh, et c'est un peu un, un peu un style macho. Et puis petit à petit, au milieu du livre, il y a de plus en plus de femmes qui arrivent. Et euh, vous en parlez avec beaucoup d'élégance, y compris euh, quand, elles sont, euh, quand elles font un métier qui est très difficile au Japon, qui est celui de, de prostituer. Ça va vous amener sur la piste des trafics d'êtres humains, notamment en provenance d'Europe de l'Est au Japon. Est-ce que vous pourriez un peu nous parler de, de ces femmes que vous avez appris à connaître et qui sont hôtesses ou prostituées Bien sûr, ça commence dans les offices japonais. Il n'y avait pas de femmes dans les offices que j'ai envoyées avec moi quand nous allions à notre premier posting. But You know, working and sort of covering the vice in Japan, you meet a, a lot of people that are very smart and savvy. I mean, it's, it's a man's world, so you meet these hostesses or yakuza mistresses who have discovered a way to play off their beauty or their charm or their intelligence to survive. And when you listen to them talk about, you know, their, their customers or... Um, how they get a guy to spend as much money as they can on them. It's kind of interesting because they, they have their self-awareness is very, very high. In, in the book, there are people who are human trafficking victims and there are people who cooperated with the work that I did. And I have been very careful not to name them because unfortunately we live in a society where people are very judgmental about women that have sold their, sold their bodies or sold their sexual services, even if that woman did it um, of her own free will because she, she felt it was a good job and it was an easy way to make money. And since the book has come out, I've stayed in touch with some of the people there. Uh, one person came and visited with her, her son um, and her husband, and I don't think her husband knew what she had been doing in Japan. And I realized, you know, like, I'm so glad that I obscured the details there because he'll never figure it out. I mean, maybe he suspects, but I don't think he does. And, and even if he did know, I don't think it would ruin the marriage, but it wouldn't help. And there are some female reporters in there that are, are 
really interesting as well. And, and you know, to be a female reporter in Japan and be on the police beat, you have to be tough as nails. Because I mean, I have a handicap being a foreigner, but actually, I think it's much harder to be a woman in Japan than it is to be a foreigner, especially a moderately white foreigner. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a Jewish American, so I don't know how white I am. But you know, I, I'm going in the in the hierarchy of how people treat you know people in Japan. It's probably you know, uh, white male is over Japanese woman, because it's very sexist and mm. it hasn't changed much. Aujourd'hui, Tadam Masagoto euh, est bouddhiste dans un temple. Est-ce qu'il vous écrit une lettre euh, à Noël pour vous souhaiter la bonne année Bullshit, il n'est pas un zen monk. Non Non, non, les États-Unis ont mis him sur a, a blacklist parce qu'il est maintenant opérant comme Yakuza out of Cambodia. Il est laundering money pour les Yamaguchi-gumi. Il est funding un splinter group de Yamaguchi-gumi. Il n'a jamais repenté. Vous pouvez lire ses mémoires, c'est appelé Habakari Nagara, qui signifie like, Pardon me, but. It's usually used in a sentence like, um, Habakari Nagara, oh my god, machigatu, which is like, pardon me, but you're totally full of shit, asshole. And that's the title of his book. There, there's not a word of remorse expressed to the people he's hurt or destroyed in his life. And, and as a matter of fact, that two years after the book came out, um, the family of one, the family of Nozaki, who was killed by Goto's thugs, sued him in court for the murder of their family member, and he had to pay damages and apologize to them. Now, if Japan was a just country and the prosecutors had some balls, he would be in jail instead of living it up in Cambodia. But at least he had to pay a million dollars, which tells you that's what's the price of killing someone in Japan is if you're Yakuza boss, 1.4 million dollars. Ça fait quelques mois que la Yamaguchi Gumi, qui est donc euh, pour les lectrices de Mademoiselle, la plus grosse branche des Yakuza actuellement au Japon, est en train de se déchirer euh, suite à des luttes internes. Quel regard vous vous portez là-dessus Vous êtes content You know, it's, it, it's hard because the Yamaguchi Gumi has been around 100 years, since 1915. Not as long as Martial Lee, which has been around since 1700s, 1703, I think. But, you know, has at least 100 years in existence. I know people on both sides. So I don't know who to root for. And in terms of everyday life, the, 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 the weird thing about Jap organized crime in Japan is they have the offices, and they have business cards, They have fan magazines. So sometimes I write an article and I know that it's going to make someone in the Yamaguchi community very upset. It doesn't stop me from writing it, but I make a phone call to someone and say like, you know, heads up, like in tomorrow's paper, there's going to be a photo that you don't like. I'm just letting you know. But now I don't know who to call. And because Goto is sponsoring the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi, because he's investing money on their side, I'm kind of hoping that the original Yamaguchi Gumi wins. But, you know, I can't play sides, right? I mean, I have to report objectively, and I know people on both sides, so it's hard for me to figure out where it's going to go. In the end, I think that the two groups will coexist, because it's just too expensive to have a Yakuza war. I mean, since the split, we've had one death, one Molotov cocktail thrown into a car. Uh, it's been generally very peaceful, and it actually seems like the Japanese media is disappointed there isn't more bloodshed. But I mean, it's Japan. And, The Yakuza are a business, and if you run a business in a way that you have civilians being threatened and people are upset, the police are going to crack down and that's bad for business. So I think what will happen is you'll just see the two organizations coexist, divide up their territory, and Japan, instead of having 21 organized crime groups, will have 22 organized crime groups. Because right now the police are doing the paperwork to designate the splinter group a designated Yakuza group, which means that they can enforce stricter regulations against them because that's how it works in Japan. They don't eliminate organized crime, they regulate it. Oui, il faut rappeler aux mademoiselles que les Yakuza au Japon peuvent avoir pignon sur rue sous forme de structure associative. Donc c'est je dirais pas jusqu'à dire que c'est légal mais en tout cas, il faut pas imaginer la mafia à l'italienne qu'on voit dans les films. Une dernière question, vous avez vu ce qu'il y a de pire dans le Japon Vous le dites dans votre livre jusqu'à l'écœurement. Pourquoi vous vous y vivez toujours Because overall, most Japanese people are very polite and honest, and reciprocity is a huge part of the society. If you do a favor for someone, they pay you back. It's very easy to understand what your relationship is with someone. They have public health care, which we don't have in the United States, and I've got some serious medical issues, so until the United States gets public health care, I'll probably always live in Japan. And also, I just like Japan. You see the worst sides of it, but I also see the good sides of it. And In general, Japanese people are very honest. 
they're hard to get to know because they're always kind of keep a distance. Um, but once you become friends with them, you become very good friends with them. And that's nice to have because in real life, most of us don't have uh, friends that would put their lives on the line for us. And in Japan, I found that I have some that will do that. Merci beaucoup, Jack Edelstein. Et euh, voilà, j'espère euh, que ça vous a convaincu d'aller vous procurer Tokyo Vice des éditions Marshallie. Thank you very much for your time. <rire> il y a eu un, un, un boom dans l'édition indépendante qui a commencé il y a une dizaine d'années. Je pense que 